All right, hello everyone. Like she said, I'm from the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. I'm talking about some prairie restoration uh, research that I've done at two different sites. So first I'm going to talk about our prairie in the DFW area. Britt is in Fort Worth and I work primarily in the Fort Worth Prairie which is part of the Grand Prairie. So here on the left this is our eco regions that we have in the DFW area. There's two main prairies that we have. On Fort Worth we've got the Grand Prairie and then going across Dallas is the Blackland Prairie and um, on the map to the left the Blackland Prairie is in brown, and the Fort Worth Prairie is that light green there. And then um, on each side of them, there's bands of cross timbers, woods. And then the next, the middle one here is, that's a survey that was done in the 1940s. And um, that kind of shows the extent of the Fort Worth Prairie in the 1940s. And if you see this tiny little black area right there, that was the extent of the city of Fort Worth at that point in time. And then if you look over at the map from the 2000s, you can see that, of course, that urban area has grown exponentially and the prairie has shrunken exponentially. So we've got um, the gray area that is labeled 46, that's urban. Um, the kind of off-white beige color that's 44, that's all cropland. So basically all of the blackland prairie that was covering Dallas has been completely converted to cropland because it has very fertile soil. And then if you look over on the Fort Worth side, uh, most of the prairie is gone. And then the small amount of prairie that is left is silver blue stem Texas winter grass grassland, which is generally poor grassland, early successional, um, has probably been disturbed many times. So there we've got um, a prairie community kind of similar to you guys, but of course we're a whole lot more dry. And so we've got the milkweeds, our main grasses are little blue stem, big blue stem, Indian grass, all the gramas, Texas grama, tall grama, side oats grama, all of that. Um, and then of course all the beautiful wildflowers. Lots of cool milkweeds, the one in the middle there is side cluster milkweed. I'm not sure if y'all have that there, but we have a lot of it um, there in Fort Worth. And then of course like green milkweed and the antelope horns. And so that's kind of the prairie plant community that um, we're going for with all of these restoration projects that I'm gonna talk to you about today. So like I said, two studies. One was done at the Fort Worth Nature Center. And there um, I kind of looked at the former land use of these prairies and some of the management um, that they had done there at the Fort Worth Nature Center and then the effect of the remnant native ve vegetation. So what they had there at the Nature Center is some areas were destroyed whereas smaller pocket prairies were left intact. And then um, the second thing I'm gonna be talking about was at Britt, we are right in the center of the Fort Worth Cultural District, right in the urban area. And uh, we try to do a demonstration prairie. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the lessons that we learned trying to restore a prairie in an urban area. So the Fort Worth Nature Center, it's very large. It's one of the largest nature centers, I think, um, in Texas. They've got bison. Um, it's a mosaic kind of, of um, grasslands and uh, wooded areas. So like I said, they've got these pocket prairies there. And in the past, it was not a nature center, of course. And um, a lot of different things happened to it over the years. So one area of it had a lot of agricultural practices. There was like goat farming and cattle and um, of course like plowing and things like that. And then in another area, um, it was actually quarried. So a lot of the roads that were built in Fort Worth um, were, they got all of their gravel and sand from what is now the Fort Worth Nature Center. And so this is a map of my research sites. And like I said, there's two kind of general areas. This blue area down here, this is the area that was more agricultural disturbance. And then the red area up at the top, those are all the areas that were quarried. And um, basically, the quarries are in a whole lot worse condition. The Fort Worth Nature Center focused first more on the agricultural area. And so that was the agricultural area that they first focused on. And um, the quarry area is actually not open to the public right now, but they're trying to restore it right now so that it can be open to the public. And the little yellow stars you see are um, seed mats that I put down as part of a seed study I also did, but I'm probably not gonna have time to talk about those results today. And the photos along the bottom are just kind of an example of what the quarried areas look like at this point in time. So there's still a lot of um, stuff going on. They're trying to um, move dirt into the giant gaping holes that are in the ground at this point because it was a surface quarry. 
So what they've got is they essentially have two prairies that are their pristine prairies. They call it Farview Prairie and Little Farview Prairie, and that's kind of what the Fort Worth Nature Center um, sees as their reclamation target. So these are their prairies that ha they think have um, come a long way since they got the land, and they're really trying to replicate that um, plant community and some of the other prairies that are not so great right now. And uh, this graph down here is from the same uh, paper that was made in 1946, and it kind of just shows what the native grassland is supposed to be like. And this line that you see just so bright straight up, that is little blue stem. So basically what it's saying is um, over time, little blue stem increases and essentially ends up being the climax community of the prairie without disturbance. And so some of the questions that I ask is how does the past land use affect the reclamation process? And um, to what extent can those um, little remnant prairies facilitate the passive reclamation of some of the disturbed prairies. And then how do the different management strategies that the Fourth Nature Center employed um, affect their outcome on their plant communities? And then I kind of use those, um, my research, to formulate some recommendations for the Fourth Nature Center to go forward. So the way I did this is I went to all those areas that I showed you on the map and I did community surveys. I focused on little blue stem. I focused on um, which plants were native and which plants were invasive. I also looked at species richness and then I also compared them to those prairies that um, are their target. So I wanted to see how the communities in these areas that are kind of on their way to reclamation um, matches up to the ones that they think are their successful prairies. I also wanted to look at the soil because, like I said, they're bringing in soil from outside sources to fill these quarry holes. Um, so I wanted to see how the soil that is existing there in some of those native communities compares to some of the soil that they were bringing in from outside areas. And a note on that soil, none of the soil that was coming in, the Fort Worth Nature Center didn't know exactly um, the quality of that soil or anything. It's part of uh, the city of Fort Worth, so the city of Fort Worth kind of is just, um, whenever I guess they have some type of construction type of thing that they need to dispose of the dirt, um, the Fort Worth Nature Center accepts the soil into their giant holes. So when it came to the agricultural disturbance, I looked at some areas that had not been disturbed or hadn't been disturbed in the past you know, 45 years or so. And then I looked at those areas that had been previously disturbed by agriculture, but have pretty much had little to no management over the, the past 45 years since the 70s. They kind of just um, didn't really do anything. There has been a few really small things. Like I know that they have Boy Scouts that come and you know, put some little seed balls and stuff, but no big you know, restoration things. And so this is kind of um, what I looked at. If you'll see the graph on the left shows the white is the native plants, cover of native plants, and then the, um, the next one, the striped, is the cover of invasive plants, and then uh, solid black is bare ground, and then the one at the top is other. And by other, I mean anything that is not a living plant or bare ground. So that's generally like litter on the ground, not not like trash litter, but you know like dead leaves and dead grass and things like that. But also other things, moss. Um, the, angel snot stuff that you get on the ground. I'm not sure what y'all call it, but the, <laughs> the prairie, you know, prairie molds or whatever. Um, so basically what I found was that um, after 45 years of little to no management, just leaving these prairies alone, they essentially came back to what they previously were. The only problem was um, that there is more invasive growth. So you can see here, this is the disturbed prairies. They do have far more invasive plants, whereas in the ones that were never really disturbed, there's not much invasive growth whatsoever. And then if you look at the little blue stem cover, um, it's a little bit greater in the undisturbed prairies, but actually that result is not significant. So it's trending towards uh, more little blue stem in the undisturbed prairies, but it's actually not significant. So with the quarries, there's a, a lot of different things that they've done over the years to try to reclaim these quarries. And so there's a lot of different sites that I surveyed, so try to bear with me while I'm describing some of these sites. Um, so I looked at prairies in the area that were never disturbed. Basically what happened when they came into quarry, like I said, it's a mosaic of prairies and um, woods. Well it's more difficult, I guess, to remove trees, obviously, than it is to remove prairies, so whichever prairies were 
large enough to get the giant trucks into, they essentially quarried those out. And so the only prairies that are really left are these small pocket prairies that I guess wasn't worth it to, for them to get their trucks into and quarry things out. So I looked at some of those um, undisturbed pocket prairies that were still left in the quarry area. Um, there are some areas of the quarry that have been dug out 45 years ago and never managed. They're still just gaping holes in the ground. Then there's um, one area that was 35 years ago, they put some soil amendments on it. They were haphazard soil amendments. I call it that because um, it was a mixture of, I think, like commercial fertilizer and bison dung that they got from the bison there at the Nature Center. And so that was done 35 years ago on one. And then um, there were some others that were had been filled. So Q9F, that means that it was quarried 45 years ago. And then nine years ago, it was filled with the soil. And then Q3F, three years ago was filled with soil. And then there were some other areas that they actually filled nine years ago and then they planted them and seeded them with native seeds, whereas some of the other ones that were filled, they just put the fill soil in there and then they just let whatever grow that came. And these are some of the photos of that. So this is what it looks like, um, the ones that have been quarried for 45, year, 45 years ago and then nothing happened. You can tell it's just basically a hole in the ground. And then this is what it looks like when they fill those areas. So with the quarries, it was a little bit more complicated what was going on. I wanted to look at the native plant growth and then also, like I said, um, the similarity to the target that they're trying to get to. The graph on the left, those little letters that you see next to the bars, those indicate significance. So basically within one category, say the other category at the top, if they both have the same letter, that means they're not significantly different, that they're basically in the same group. But if they have a different letter, that means that it is significantly different than the others. And that's within, within each category, so within native, invasive, bare ground, and other. And then along the bottom, I have all of those quarry um, different treatments that I was talking about in the different time. And basically, I have it arranged by time, so by disturbance time. So the farthest to the right are those native prairies that haven't been disturbed in probably at least 45 years. And then the farthest left is a quarry that was just filled less than a year before I did this experiment, so had just been disturbed. And so if you just look at the just the native plants in general, um, you can see that here, this is the one that was seeded, and it has far more native cover than any of the others, so the seeding obviously was very successful that they did. Here's the one that was filled at the same time and not seeded at all, and you can see this is the invasive, so um, seeding it with the natives really did help kick out some of those invasives and allow those native plants to grow. Um, those that were actually, um, had the soil amendments here and were left for 35 years did pretty okay with the natives as well. And then we've got our native one over here. So this is kind of the amount of native plants that we are going for. You can see that on the native prairie that hadn't been disturbed in a really long time, the other category is really big. That's because these, um, these prairies have been going for long enough that they need disturbance, right? So they need to be burned or something like that. Um, but because the Forest Nature Center is kind of in the city, it's hard for them to burn as often as they would like, of course, because of all the buildings and stuff around it. So um, when we go over to just look at the little blue stem cover alone and not the cover of native plants, it's kind of like a very more straightforward story. So the little blue stem is corresponding with time since disturbance. The native prairies that had the longest amount of time since disturbance have the highest amount of little blue stem cover. And then the ones that have been disturbed within the past 10 years or so um, have barely any little blue stem cover. Even the ones that were filled and seeded, um, even though they were seeded with little blue stem, the little blue stem was not that successful. And so looking just at the seeding and planting effectiveness on its own, you can see that um, so I looked at one area was seeded and one area was seeded and actually planted with live plants. And so I looked to see if there was a difference between those two areas, and there really wasn't in the cover of native plants, not a significant difference. Um, I also looked at the area adjacent to the seeded area because I was thinking, well, maybe the seeds have had enough time to you know, kind of spread over to the adjacent area. But you can see that the unseeded adjacent area is just the same as areas that were not adjacent to the seeded area um, and not seeded. So the seeds haven't quite begun to spread yet to other areas that weren't seeded, but they have been successful. Um, but, and I also looked at the seedling abundance. So on this one, I believe um, they would have been seeded a good 
nine to 10 years before I did this. And you can see that the areas that were seeded still have a greater seedling abundance. So those seeds are still sprouting and still you know, doing their job 10 years later. So even if you seed something uh, and you don't see those instant results, you know, maybe give it some time and, and things will still happen. So then I wanted to look at the soil because I realized that the areas that were being seeded, even though all those native plants were growing, a lot of the plants that they wanted, like the little blue stem and like those climax grasses, the Indian grass, the big blue stem, they weren't growing and that's really what um, the Nature Center wanted. They don't want just a wildflower meadow, they want an actual tall grass prairie. So I went in for them and uh, I looked at the soil because like I said, they didn't really know what was going on with their soil. So what I did was I did a soil PCA. Um, this basically takes all the different parameters, the texture and the, um, all the nutrients and kind of puts it into a graph that can be more easily grasped by the human mind, I suppose. Um, it kind of pins down your variation to two different axes. The uh, x-axis, the horizontal axis, uh, corresponds more to the texture, where we have more sandy soils here on the left and the more clay soils there on the right. And then the y-axis um, actually corresponds more to like the nutrients and stuff. And you can see that we've got calcium up here on the top and then some of the other nutrients more on the bottom. What was the question? It's a principal component analysis is what PCA stands for. And so basically, so here's the fill from the nine years, and that's the area that they had seeded nine years ago and were wondering why these grasses weren't growing. And as you can see, it's coming out pretty sandy and grouped far away from some of the other things. The lime green at the top, that's that real tight grouping, that's my native prairie target. So you can see that the soils of the native prairie are very tightly grouped in this one area and that, you know, that certain way. And then these are all the other, the reclamation that they're trying to do. And so the soil is still pretty far off from really what they want and what is going to support uh, the plant community that they, that they want. And um, what they were doing is they were putting um, lesser quality fill deep down in the holes and then trying to put better quality fill in the top two to three feet of the holes. And so I looked at that deep fill to see exactly how bad it was. And you can see this is the gray. It's grouped down here. It had a really high pH, really high sodium um, levels. So a bunch of things that you don't really want to grow plants in generally or not for these prairies certainly. Um, so pretty much figured out exactly what we thought and that was that the quarry soil that was coming in and filling these holes was actually kind of detrimental to the prairie restoration uh, because the plants didn't want to grow in the low quality soil. So when it came to the passive reclamation that was done in those agricultural areas, after 45 years um, with those remnant prairies still being in the area, those prairies essentially came back from the agricultural disservice 100%. Not much invasive growth, um, the climax community was there, the little blue stem, um, the species richness is there and similar to those native prairies that were um, remained. And like I said, the, uh, the time of Little Blue Stem establishment, or Little Blue Stem establishment was linked very closely to the time since disturbance. So uh, whereas some of the other native plants, we could easily seed for them and they'd come right in, mainly like wildflowers, annuals, of course. Um, <clears throat> that Little Blue Stem was really just needed time, needed lots of time to do its thing. Just leave it alone. And if there's Little Blue Stem in the area, it'll come in on its own, you know. Um, these are some of the pocket prairies I was talking about. As you can see, it looks like it really needs to be burned soon, um, but it's not something that's really feasible for them right now. And um, this other one is just a photo of that one of their prairies that is their, um, their kind of target prairie that they really want. So um, I kind of, with the passive reclamation, my recommendations is that is better for the Fort Worth Nature Center. If there's those areas, um, if in the area there's some propules that can come over, and if also if time is not a factor. So if they're okay with waiting 45 years for the native community to come back, then just wait, you know? Don't do anything, because you're gonna mess it up if you, if you, you rush it, you know? Uh, so, but when it comes to the active reclamation, which has to be done in some of the areas there, um, 
Obviously, seeding and planting is great. Accelerated the establishment of all the species that they wanted. My recommendation to them was to use green hay. Since they already have prairie areas that kind of need um, some type of disturbance, and that's their target plant community, go ahead and hay that up, and then put it on your other prairies that you want to restore, and then you'll have the propagules from the exact community that you want to restore, essentially. Um, and then when it comes to the acceleration of little blue stem establishment, though, I don't really think anything that they're doing um, was helping that whatsoever. Um, they did do some soil amendments that worked maybe a little bit. The planting worked a little bit, but the seeding didn't really work that great. And um, this photo here, you can see, so that's the Farview Prairie, one of their target prairies that they really like. And those green little arrows, you can kind of see bands of dark color. Those bands are bands of little blue stem, and that's a limestone outcrop. So that's really showing that the soil has a big thing to do with the little blue stem growth. The little blue stem is growing on those bands where the, um, the limestone is seeping out. And in between the bands, that's where the limestone is even a, a higher concentration, and that's generally just full of seep mealy. So what you've got there is kind of stripes of little blue stem seep muley, little blue stem seep muley, and that's going with completely the soil, um, not really what was seeded there or anything like that. So that kind of proves that um, they need to get the, get the soil right in order to grow some of those um, climax grasses that they really care about. And these are two comparisons. So these are both quarry areas that were filled nine, 10 years ago. This is the one that was seeded, and this is the one that's not seeded. The one that was not seeded is a, the same color green completely, where the other one that was seeded is all different colors of green. And that kind of just shows the invasive growth. The one that, is, that was never seeded, that's the same sea of green, that all ended up being Bermuda grass, basically. Because the soil that they were bringing in, it already had Bermuda propagules in it. And they didn't seed it, they didn't do anything. So the Bermuda just spread, and it essentially became a, you know, a golf course. So there with the, um, the quarry, like I said, the soil that they're bringing in is low quality. So I basically recommended to the Nature Center that um, unless those quarries need to be filled, try to not bring in this bad dirt because it's really doing a disservice. Like I said, it, it not only was bringing in Bermuda propules, but also Johnson grass and um, the Arundo Donax, which is horrible there. So, um, and those are all things that we're, are generally not in the nature center. There's generally a lot of natives there. So, um, like I said, the quality of the fill really matters. These areas, they want to fill these quarries so that people can, can walk on them, so that there can be hiking trails. So they care about the topography. They don't want someone to be walking and then just fall in these giant pits. Um, but my, <laughs> of course, but my recommendation was that um, if you could somehow make that safer, just kind of leave the pits because they're really doing better now. So they've got these pits like this one here. It has Hasn't, it hasn't been filled, nothing's happened to it for the past 45 years, and it's already a complete perfect prairie down inside the hole. So if you come now and fill it with the dirt now, you're going to have another potentially 40 years before it's back looking like this again. So, you know, if, if, you, can, if you can put up with a topography that's crazy, it's a little bit better than maybe flatting it all out, but then it just being a flat field of Bermuda and Johnson grass. Um, and then just uh, recommending to them that they fill immediately and reduce the disturbance when they do fill. So um, they have these holes around them as little blue stem. And what they had been doing was coming in and kind of clearing the whole thing and then filling it out. And I recommended to them, well, just fill the hole and don't disturb all the little blue stem around the hole. And then the little blue stem can creep in, you know, because it would still be around the outside. So just kind of some of these small lessons to be learned about filling these giant quarry holes. And this photo here really shows it really well. This to the right here is the spot I was telling you that is all 100% Bermuda. This is where it wasn't filled. And you can see there's there's really like a line of little blue stem where you can see this is where they you know plowed everything up and filled it, and then this is where they did nothing, and the little blue stem is thriving and absolutely beautiful. Okay, so that's it for talking about the Fort Worth Nature Center, and now I'm going to talk about the prairie restoration that we did at Brit, which is uh, like I said a little bit different because it's in an urban environment, and there's absolutely no passive reclamation that could happen because there are no propagules coming in from anywhere, um, no native propagules certainly. 
So the study site is BRIT. It's in Fort Worth. We are actually conjoined with the Fort Worth Botanical Gardens. So we've got botanical gardens on one side, BRIT on the other side. BRIT has mainly native landscaping, and of course botanical gardens have, has all kinds of crazy landscaping. Um, we're right off of the Trinity River, and like I said, right in the middle of the cultural district, right in the middle of urban concrete jungle. And so we decided that we wanted to um, make some type of demonstration prairie in the back. So this new building that Britt just built um, has only been there for about six years now. Previous to that, it was a public health building. This is a picture here of um, the red is where they wanted Brit to be, and then that's the old public health building. And the prairie, the demonstration prairie that we made is in the back here. So the back prairie area, half of it used to be a parking lot. And this is what it looked like during construction. This is the, our Brit building. We have a green roof, and um, this whole area is an herbarium with over a million specimens in it. And so that's them making the prairie out in the back. Um, unfortunately, at first it was not so successful. We had a, just a regular construction company coming in and making this, and um, we realized quickly that the practices that they were doing were not so good for creating a native prairie. Um, so obviously the soil was horrible and disgusting and compacted from all the construction and from what used to be there before. And then after that they came in, and in order to seed some of the native prairie um, seeds, they used hydro mulch. Um, and it made it to where nothing sprouted. I mean, it was, it was a desolate wasteland, basically. And then the company also, I believe, applied like four times the amount of herbicide that you're supposed to apply in an entire year in one application. So, <laughs> needless to say, not that many things were growing out there. And we were like, man, well, what can we do to get this prairie jump started? And so what we came up with was that we really needed to do something to the soil and do some soil remediation. And so, of course, since um, it's the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, we did some research with it. We didn't want to just do something. We wanted to make an experiment. So what we did was we came up with these um, living prairie soil tests. And so we, we chose two different soil amendments. One was a biological amendment or a compost tea. This was put together for us by um, a company. And um, I think that their formula is slightly secret, but it has um, basically what it sounds like. Compost tea has got like molasses and stuff in there to like jumpstart all the microbes, you know, and feed them some food. And then it's got um, all the, I don't know, like organic matter and stuff like that in there. Um, then we went and we got some actual living prairie soil as well for the other part of our experiment. So we came in and we thought, well, if this wasn't an urban area, what would this have been in the beginning? And we came up with a, it would be a riparian prairie because we're right off the banks of the Trinity River. And so um, we wanted to find a riparian prairie that we could take a little bit of soil from, um, not to completely replace our soil with that good prairie soil, but to simply inoculate it with all the microbes that were growing in that prairie soil. And so we created um, these kind of plots that you see here, these stripes. So um, one area got absolutely nothing, one area got the biological amendments, one area got the living soil, and then one area got both the living soil and the biological amendments. And so our living soil source, we got it from a ranch um, nearby in Fort Worth uh, from one of our board members. And the area is not that big. You can see that there's like 11 meters by 2 meters by 30 meters or so. And we took the top three inches off. Um, we did a lot of practices, obviously, to try to make sure that we didn't disturb the area or have any adverse effects on it. Even though you can kind of tell from the photo here, um, this area was an area that uh, he's not grazing with his cattle or anything like that, so it really has a lot of woody encroachment and likely will not be a prairie for long if something's not done. Um, so we went in and um, we like removed all of the top stuff off, like the, the uh, you know all the dead grass and everything from the top. We dug up some of the clumping grasses to kind of save and plant back. Then we took up some of the soil and then. Um, 
put, like I said, put some of those grasses back in there and then put like a layer of hay kind of down or like prairie hay, I guess you would call it, watered it and everything to try to make sure. And uh, we've been monitoring this for, I think, four years now and it's basically come back to almost 100% of what it was before. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we weren't hurting this rancher's little prairie patch here, but we wanted to get some of the good stuff for our prairie as well. And so, basically, like I said, we put that on. We put the biological soil limits on maybe like four or five years ago, and we've just been monitoring it ever since. So every season we go out there and we do community surveys. Um, I've also done some biomass surveys where I actually clip the grass and try to see if they're um, helping or changing the biomass in any way. And we focus on, of course, the cover of native plants there, um, the diversity and the presence of those climax grasses. So we want the big blue stem, the little blue stem, and the Indian grass. So here's some of our results. I believe this is after four years. So we've got on the left the biological amendments, next the living soil, next no treatment, and then to the far right is both the bio amendments and the living soil. And this is looking at um, native grasses, which is in the green, native forbs, which is the goldish color, invasive grasses, white, and then invasive forbs, which is black. And so you can see that the living soil really did the best job of making everything grow and also kicking out those invasives. So the biological amendments did great for both the native and the invasives. But the living soil did great for just the natives alone, and that's what we were really going for. Um, like I said, we have the same problems with Johnson grass and Bermuda grass, basically, is what we're trying to get rid of out there. Um, so yeah, the living soil did the best. You can see the one with the biological amendments and the living soil has the, in, uh, the invasive grasses as well as the biological amendments. So I really think the biological amendments will, were helping the Johnson grass out a lot, which is not something that we wanted whatsoever. So when I was just looking at those grasses, like the individual grasses that we have, the most common grass that we have is silver blue stem. So that's kind of indicative of a really primarily succession type of situation, early succession. Um, and that's kind of everywhere. But then there's also some things that didn't really grow in the areas that didn't have some of the amendments. So you can see the blue at the top is blue grama. It didn't grow at all in the, in the no treatment area and it only grew with the addition of the biological amendments and the living soil. Um, you can see like the striped, the black and white stripe, that's the Bermuda grass. So you can see the biological amendments really did help the growth of the Bermuda grass, which is not something we wanted. The um, orangish color, that's buffalo grass. So the buffalo grass is another species that didn't seem to really grow at all in the no treatment area, but um, was facilitated clearly by the biological amendments in the living soil. And, um, but the side oats grama, for some reason, was slightly better in the area with no treatment, and it didn't really seem to, um, to be affected by any of the living soil or the bio amendments. What I did see was that the species that were in common at that native site that we got the living soil from and that we, were, that we had propagules for, that we had seeded for in our native prairie. Those are the ones that the living soil helped, which makes sense, right? Because those microbes have these symbiotic relationships with a specific grass maybe or a specific forb or whatever. And so um, the living soil that we put in probably had the microbes for, for that, the most microbes for that community that was there. And so that community that was there was little blue stem and like meadow drop seed and some things like that. So um, I think that we did kind of show that a lot of the things that were there, those exact microbes were likely in the living soil that we took and put on an our prairie there. So that's a picture of our prairie now. I believe that was taken just um, a few months ago in the nice um, the heat of the spring. And so um, these are kind of my conclusions. Like I said, the biological amendments helped generally. General plant growth, it did great for, but the living soil really was that targeted plant growth that we were really looking for. And we were really satisfied with not only that it targeted the plant growth of the natives, but it also limited the growth of all those invasives that we, we'd never wanted in the first place. So these are some people, of course, that I'd like to acknowledge. Lots of good field assistants and lots of um, doctors helping me. And of course, I'll take any questions that anyone has. 
So basically we just took the living soil, you know, took it off of the surface, and then we brought it over to the Brit site, and I mean, we just sprinkled it on. It was really, it's not deep at all, because if you can, you, you might can tell, the area that we were putting it onto is way larger than the area we took it from. So whereas in the area we took it from, we probably took it six inches down or so, but um, on the prairie when we applied it, we just tilled it in very lightly to the very top, maybe three inches of the soil or so, and watered it in. Heather, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone.